I was glad to be out of that downstairs study with the queer odor and vague suggestions of vibration. Yet could not, of course, escape a hideous sense of dread and peril and cosmic abnormality as I thought of the place I was in and the forces I was meeting. The wild, lonely region, the black, mysteriously forested slope towering so close behind the house, the footprints in the road, the sick, motionless whisperer in the dark, the hellish cylinders and machines, and above all, the invitations to strange surgery and stranger voyagings. These things, all so new and in such sudden succession, rushed in on me with a cumulative force which sapped my will and almost undermined my physical strength. These are the words of Albert Wilmarth, professor of literature at Miskatonic University, as he contemplates the potentially mind-shattering revelations he encounters in the novella The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft. On this episode of Roll Off a Tangent, Robert Gibson, XJ, Nikita, and yours truly, Anthony, will explore yet another Lovecraftian tale that pits terrified New England academics against unknowable cosmic beings. First published in Weird Tales, in August 1931, The Whisperer in Darkness is the account of Professor Wilmarth as he describes his interactions with Henry Akeley, an amateur folklorist who lives on an isolated farm in Vermont. At first incredulous, Wilmarth begins to suspect there is something more than madness behind the increasingly frantic claims made by Akeley. The story is told from Wilmarth's perspective, but features long passages written in the form of letters from Akeley that Wilmarth reads throughout the tale. Lovecraft uses this epistolary style, similar to the structure used in Bram Stoker's Dracula, to great effect. Each letter increases the tension as Akeley reports growing fear and danger as he investigates rumors of strange creatures in the ominous forests of his home state. Are the beings described by Akeley merely a hoax or the ravings of a madman? Or are there actually things from another world prowling the shadowed hills of New England? Eventually, Wilmarth travels to Vermont himself to bear witness to the horrible truth behind Akeley's letters. Welcome again, gentlemen, and uh, I wanted to launch right in after that intro and see what everyone thinks and what everyone thought of their reading of this tale, The Whisperer in Darkness. So, uh, I don't know, do you, who wants to start? Uh, maybe Nikki, I'll pick on you. Do you want to launch in? or <laughs> I'm always is there anyone starting. Else that Wants to volunteer? Or? I will be the lamb um, to your slaughter. Is this fine? Uh, <laughs> I will be the black sheep, Shabnigarov. Uh, speaking of Shabnigarov, um, I do not know what you can boast, uh, dear gentlemen, but uh, I have killed Shabnigarov before, actually a hundred times over, in a game called Quake. The, fir- the very first Quake, the last boss, okay. is Shabnigarov. I never played goat. Quake, so no. Well, congratulations! Uh, well, never you played got, Quake. You, you got to play Quake. You know, it's it's sure. a step up. All right, everybody in the in the comments is going to uh, is going to disagree, but I think it's a step above uh, Doom. Like Doom was really good, and then you play Quake, and you're like, whoa, the level design is just crazy. Um, anyway, uh, let's let's talk about the the Whisperer in Darkness. Uh, which I have uh, been calling Whisperer of Darkness to all of my friends and colleagues for the past, uh, I don't know, two and, a, two and a half weeks. So I'll, I'll do my best not call it that uh, on the recording. Yeah, it's, it's really good. <laughs> it's one of those um, tales that when you read, you kind of get what Lovecraft is all about, why people like him. and what type of things that he is capable of, as uh, Robert likes to say, uh, hide away uh, in order to make the story work. Because there are like clunky bits in it, but it doesn't matter. Not one single moment, not one iota. All of the things uh, that would annoy me, um, you know, like abruptness of the of the piece or the constant insertion of letters and uh, tapes and repetitions of um, the uh, professor uh, Alfred uh, 
you know, saying like, you know, oh, again, as I'm saying this from memory, he says it about five or six times, but it doesn't matter. It works. In this story, it works. I don't know how he did it, but um, you really have, you really get engrossed into the situation and you grow, get engrossed from the first word because Lovecraft challenges you. He says, the, the narrator didn't see anything, really. Mm-hmm. And then he proceeds to attempt to horrify you with that premise in mind. And I really like that. I really like the fact that he set this challenge and then he followed through, you know, because he never did see the aliens, truly, these strange creatures. Can you really call them aliens? Eldritch monsters, let's say. Yeah, I mean, it's full of um, character. Um, the, the farmer is, is just amazing. And his sudden transition that happens uh, close to the third act of the story is just as gripping. Um, if I ever had one complaint, it's, ju- it's just that maybe Alfred is a bit of a doofus. You know, <laughs> that's about it. You know, but I can't really blame him. Uh, I, would too, would be very curious to see uh, what was really going on there. I think the curiosity would kill that cat. Yeah, I mean, what's what's more is there to say? There's so many awesome um, characters from the mythos that get mentioned uh, as research is continuing. I mean, my favorite being, of course, Shabnigara, the black goat, mother of all. Right. Um, but also there is this underlying situation that transpires again at the end of the th- uh, at the beginning of the third act. And that is with the confession of the farmer where he says, um, in so many words, he says, this might be bigger than us from a different perspective because there's another side that has been messing with the two of us. And whether or not you believe uh, that claim, it introduces something interesting into the story that's not explored, unfortunately, but I really like the idea that it's not like they're all sitting there on a cloud, Cthulhu with Shabnigarov and Haster, and they're all like shaking hands. I like the idea that just like they are fighting the mortal realm, there's a certain conquest, a competition between them that uh, is ongoing and constant and limitless. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it introduces so many concepts. It's, it's one of those stories that uh, when you read first, you kind of have to reread it slightly just to be sure that you got everything correct. But not because you thought you missed something because of bad writing, but because you're just looking for clues and trying to find out a little bit more. And if the story gets you to do that, well, I think it succeeds in whatever it was trying to accomplish. Uh, Robert, yeah. what about you? What did you think about The Whisper in Darkness? I read it many times over the course of a long lifetime and I think it's definitely one of the very top Lovecraft stories the top um, dozen or so stories Uh, I think it's remarkable remarkably pure science fiction Um, just one just a, a few a small handful of his stories are pure science fiction and this is one of them never mind about Niall or Thotep or whatever. It's pure science fiction, but it's got the spirit of a horror story. And remarkably, among his stories that are like that, the monsters are quite small. They're actually smaller than human beings. They're not Cthulhu size, anything like it. They're not Dunwich horror size. Uh, They're not Shoggoth size. What they do have, which these other monsters don't have, is numbers. There are many of them, and you get the sense of this poor farmer, Akeley, being surrounded by them and needing to get out. And you think, get out, get out, go on, get out. And he doesn't get out because the alternative would be going to California, which apparently is even worse. Uh, from the decision that he makes. Uh, anyway, I can un- I, you know sympathise. Um, <laughs> he 
the um, thing about not seeing the monsters, which Nikki mentioned, yes, you're right. Wilmoth doesn't see them, but he hears them. And that mm. is even more effective in a story like this. Because after all, they are described um, at second hand. So you do know what they are supposed to look like. It's just that the narrator himself doesn't see them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the narrator also, uh, as I think Nicky also mentioned, uh, I don't, don't know what doofus is, but he certainly can be accused of being naive. Uh, and that he, he ought to have realised uh, that that last le letter purportedly from Akeley was just a, a lure by the enemy. But then again, uh, it's I find it not too incredible that someone would let himself be fooled in that way. After all, there's a tremendous resistance in our ordinary lives to believing in the... Uh, the astonishing, even while the evidence mounts up. So that, in a sense, is a plus uh, in the story. Of course, it adds to the dramatic irony because the, the reader knows perfectly well what's uh, what's happening. It's not as the, the shock that comes at the end is quite good. Um, I I found it quite good the first time I read it, but um, it's not. It's not an absolutely astonishing thing. It's it, a logical outcome of the rest of the story, which is as it should be. And the last thing I want to say is um, the realism of the story is is fantastic. The description of Vermont, sorry, that, that's a bit of an oxymoron. The realism is fantastic. I mean, the realism is realistic, uh, is... Uh, very praiseworthy and the vermont floods of 1927 were actually historical by the way mm -hmm. and the, the the description of the state makes me want to to visit it myself so you could get your yeah. brain in a jar right mm, well, <laughs> it wants to be a brain in a jar you, you know that that thing that you and i both mentioned about our character being gullible um I think this is one of those, th uh, I wouldn't call it a mistake, one of those things that could be literally fixed with like two sentences, him saying something along the lines of like, I knew that uh, something was amiss, that nothing of this was right, nothing of this uh, smelled fine, but I had to go and find out because the mystery was too much and the alternative would be going to California. Right, like, and then yeah, I, think that's yeah, I mean, more or less that's one of Lovecraft's ar overarching themes, right? I mean, it's this man hating California, sorry, <laughs> well, man hating California, <laughs> but also, in addition to hating California, uh, <laughs> man's overweening pride combined with his insignificance, you know, so it's you're dealing with like these academics who are like, you know, and I have the passage here because I was struck by the same thing, you know. He says things like, you know, I retired my mind aching from the quick succession of monstrous conceptions, you know, but he's thinking and he's talking him into it. There's a whole like long sequence or paragraph, at least, you know, where he's talking himself into it. You know, he's mad or sane, me metamorphosed or merely relieved. The chances were that Akeley had actually encountered some stupendous change. You know, maybe things aren't that bad. You know, he's he's. You know, Wilmarth is talking himself into it because he wants to, because he's so mm -hmm. curious. He's such a scholar. And he wants to plumb these own no, unknown depths just for the sheer sake of knowledge and plumb and discovering the unknown, which in his the Lovecraft universe is folly because it either leads you to more questions or madness and death. So it's but it's man's pride overcomes his his, his sense and reason. So yeah, yeah, those are yeah. I mean, I I was saying the same thing. Why why is Nakely leaving? California notwithstanding, you know, but it's, again, <laughs> he didn't want to give up his home, so that was pride, you know, he did, Akeley didn't want to give up his farm, it's where he lived, it was his place, you know, mm. but it was also, you know, he needed to, he needed to make a record of it almost, obsessively, and send it to Wilmarth, you know, so it was, again, he had some pride, I think, too, that was over, overriding his good sense. 
I think if this was a featured length movie, they would have gotten the guy from California involved. He'd be like this young lad who comes in and the second half of the movie, right, with a shotgun, right, or something like that. They would, they would, they would mess it all up. That's the way I see it. There uh, actually was a movie. There actually no. was a movie version made in 2011. Okay. In 2000, okay. I don't. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Let me quickly but... research it. All right, but in the meantime, so XJ, if you want to jump in while you're yeah, researching, sure. Nikki, you want to? Uh, well, uh, I'll go. Is uh, picking off the thread on uh, our professor Wilmuff. I'll even go as far as to say he wins the uh, gold medal in the Darwin Awards for that year. <laughs> it's um, it's, I mean, he uh, lived. <laughs> it is unbelievably stupid. Uh, curiosity notwithstanding and unfortunately I think uh, Anthony has frozen network issues perhaps <clears throat> mm. uh, but I, I will continue um, the letter from Akili you know it's like maybe it's a bit of a irreverence on my part but it reads like a, like a, a multi-level marketing uh, pamphlet <laughs> and 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 then and then it, the whole the whole scenario felt like a like a multi level marketing uh, 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 scene. Our 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 professor was um, uh, enticed to join. <laughs> in, sorry, I'm just reading the synopsis, and I have so many things to say, but. Please go on. Please go on with your. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm, so so okay. so our our professor and uh, joins the multi level marketing. He feels a little bit uh, uneasy in the beginning. Uh, welcome back, Anthony. I was just saying. I was just saying the last scene with uh, Will Muff, uh getting the letter. The whole thing just reads a little bit like a like a multi level marketing uh, scene. Um, our professor was uh, was uh, invited to this uh, to Akali's farm, and he joins. He f suddenly he feels a little bit unsure, and then we have the brain in the jar talk to him, and all of a sudden he's feeling good again, and then uh, he retires uh, to his room, and then yeah, things start shaking down, and it just, it, it, the whole thing just felt like. Like uh, like an experience with somebody going into multi level marketing recruitment uh, center. Uh, beyond that, though, um, we we have done a number of uh, HP Lovecraft stories. We had we had done the uh, Call of Cthulhu, um, the Shadow, the Haunter of the Dark, uh, the Dunwich Horror. Did we do anything else? No, that's it. You know. Aside from the Call of Cthulhu, for the life of me, I really have difficulty telling all the uh, Lovecraft stories apart. And yeah. I, think, I think that that is because they are all the same. Uh, like you said, it's always uh, foolish uh, uh, New England professors getting themselves into a twist. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, it's not even in the same... Venus. Well, I mean, all established authors eventually get like a formula that they follow. Uh, Robert E. Howard has a formula of his own. He writes Conan stories all the time. All his antagonists, uh, he, all his stories, most of his stories involve Conan in some form or the other. And Conan gets into trouble, you know, and then he uh, he gets out of trouble uh, somehow or the other. You know, you know the basic drift of a Conan story. I will. Mm. I will uh, let Robert, uh, you know, attack you at this point, and I will. <laughs> Whatever. Reside into the shadows. Yeah, but the the thing is, the thing is, though, Conan, Conan have different adventures. The uh, the he 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 is a king, he is a mercenary, he is a thief, he is a protector, he is. He has many, many different things. All, all the stories involve different locales, different uh, antagonists, and different uh, events. Lovecraft, though, is all the same. 
I feel like I really have difficulty telling. Well, you know, like when I was reading, when I'm reading the, uh, when I was reading the Whisperer in, in the darkness, uh, like no, I, 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 I even have trouble differentiating Haunter in the Dark and uh, the titles, like. I just felt felt like I've read this story before. And I just, mm. I, I keep, when I was reading it, I, I keep mixing it up with the Dunwich horror. You know? Because really? they're so, they're so similar. They're so similar. Some professor of uh, occult uh, happens onto some uh, thingamajiggy. And then there were a lot of dogs that died. Uh, strange things happening in some yeah. forest strange things happening in some forest somewhere uh a showdown uh at 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 the forest uh and you know some descriptions of of um of uh uh, uh alien beings and 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 things like i the Dunwich horror is a little bit different because the uh, it's more about uh, 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 it, 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 uh, the Dunwich horror is basically um, some some weirdo offering his daughter to a <laughs> a demonic god and what do you think can come out of that and this one is a little bit more of a uh stumbling into into the territory of some strange creatures or whatever but at the end of the day i really have difficulty telling the two stories apart and there were times when i mix up um uh portions of uh uh a hunter in the dark as well like really out of all the stories that we covered the only one that clearly stands out in my mind is the call of cthulhu and I think, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe you guys can help me out here. But it feels like the reason for that is because in The Call of Cthulhu, at least the protagonist is going to places. First, he starts out in, in his little uh, study in Rhode Island. Then he hires a boat uh, to go somewhere. And the accounts of uh, the sailor, the sailor uh, is he's also jumping around in places as well, go, going as far as to actually sail a boat to to where uh, the gates to Cthulhu could be found. And I think that's that's that in in my mind um, separates out the stories because everything seems to happen in the Dunwich horror and. And um, the the whisperer in the dark, everything seems to happen in some like forest. One place. Yeah. Yeah. It's and like, it, it's not, yeah, at least Cthulhu is geographically diverse. Yeah. yeah. At least the. I mean, Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu is also the same story. It's the only difference is what you both are currently mentioning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lovecraft so it's was, almost like. Lovecraft, uh, you know, never tried to get away from the formula once he hit upon it. Um, there's nothing and bad again, about it. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder if that's like a, a case of, again, the medium is the message. I mean, I know I bring this up about these pulp stories from the, you know, weird tales or, you know, from back in the day where they were publishing in this fashion in these magazines, you know, is it, it's almost like he was a painter, you know, and he's painting the same landscape over and over. Like, you know, some painters did, you know, some great painters too, you know, so it's, is it that sort of thing where he's sort of trying to almost improve on his model, improve on his I mean, subject? Th think about it. You know? uh, Lovecraft has admitted himself that his inspirations come from his nightmares, come from his dreams. Right. His dreams seem to be recurring. Yeah, 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 that's true. I mean, but this is one of his later stories. And you think about it, you know, he, he did shift to more of like a science fiction sort of style, moving away less of like the horror, well, not like more, less supernatural as he got on, it seems like, because he wrote The Mountains of Madness, I think right before or after this, you know, At the Mountains of Madness. And then there was The Shadow Out of Time, which is seems like it's more science fiction. Again, dealing with like these races of beings that were sort of aliens. And were civilizations versus these all-powerful beings. 
And it's like he just kind of name dropped, as I think Nikki said earlier, he name dropped like all, you know, all these elder gods or whatever he calls them, you know, like Shubnigarov and Hastur and, you know, Nyarlathotep and all these, you know, Cthulhu and everything. And so this is like his, he's bringing it all together, you know, so maybe he's just trying to improve on his model and his mythos with every story. But unfortunately, suffering, like you're saying, XJ, like the repetition of the recurring nightmare, such as it is. I mean, one thing I will give him, though, is <laughs> he has a knack for making a what should have been a very pastoral and pleasant woodlands and describing it in the most <laughs> horrific terms. When I'm when I was reading this, uh, this, uh, this 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 short story right uh this story this novella and and the dunwich horror as well i i kept I, I was like you know actually this woodlands is describing is quite beautiful but then he invests in all this uh subtle uh descriptions that just makes it creepy rather than than delightful and i i gotta give it to him man <clears throat> i mean i would want to visit the place that he described too just like robert but it's just because, like, if if you see past the 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 creepy descriptions, actually, what he's describing is a very, very, very nice place. <laughs> I was like, wow, that I mean, that is that is some skill right there. I can't take that away from him. But yeah, I I think um, uh, I I mean, I don't know what to say, man. It's it's like I really do have difficulty telling this this story apart and the language horror apart and. Because I've read other Lovecraft stories. Uh, I've read The Shadow Over Innsmouth. I have read uh, Mountains of Madness and The Colors Out of Space, I think. Uh, and they just blur into yeah. one hodgepodge of color for me. It's like... So you can't... You can't differ... I mean, so if you were to try to give a grade or decide which one you thought was superior between this and say its closest replica Dunwich Horror which did you find superior between this one you know Whisper in Darkness and Dunwich Horror could um, you even say probably this one uh and uh, it, it, there is a set, there is a, a sense of refinement about this one that the Dunwich Horror for me didn't have the Dunwich Horror was much, much more um uh, I don't. Uh, I think. Uh, I think the it's very subtle, but I think the the use of language is a little bit better here than in the Danish horror, from memory. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and and just looking at the dates in which they were published, they were published about two years or three years apart. Yeah, I mean, twenty nineteen twenty eight versus nineteen thirty. So, yeah, I mean, in two years, you know, if you're writing consistently, you know, improving on your style, you know, you know, think of it that way. So it's really, again, placing them in their context of time, which reading over the years of uh, reading Lovecraft over the years, I never really, you know, thought about order publication order. You know, I think a lot of the, the way they were published, the stories were kind of in some sort of weird hodgepodge mix of time periods. So, but if you really, but putting them in the context of the time in which they were written and published, you, know, you can see the improvement I mean, in the, his storytelling. The pacing of Whisper in the Darkness is definitely better than Dunwich Horror. I think Dunwich Horror is really slow. I think that was also my biggest uh, complaint about it uh, when we covered it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, well, I'm unfortunately that's 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 uh that's how I read the the story. Okay. Yeah. I guess uh, I'll pass the thing to Nikki. He has something to say about the 2011 the movie. movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh first of all, thank you moriareviews.com uh for providing me all the information I need. And also thank you Wikipedia. Um right. So the movie apparently follows the story very faithfully right up until the end. So they have two acts which are wait, wait, wait. exactly so, like So did they actually have a guy from California with a shotgun? Uh, 
No spoilers. In the movie. What? <laughs> oh, oh, you mean in the movie? I was like, the story? Did you read the story? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> there is an actor who is casted as young Akeley. So I presume something like that did happen. Oh, oh, you know, you know uh, this just reminded me of something. The, the one thing that absolutely stood out in my mind in this uh, story, right, is the name of the son of Akeley. George Good Enough Akeley. I'm, I'm, and I'm wondering, <laughs> is that a real name? It's a real name. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, back in the day, sure. All I right, think there well, was people named Good Enough, Good Now, Good and Now, Good Enough. Not good. Uh, all right. So um, after those two acts, we're, which basically go through the entirety of the story, uh, things ch uh, change dramatically. So our our dear Wilmer uh, goes into um, goes into a cave where these uh, Maigo live, and it is revealed that they are the worshippers of Shabnigarov. The protagonist attempts to uh, stop them because they're trying to open a gateway between Yagov and Earth. I mean, of course, uh, he follows the plot. But then he can't escape. He is unsuccessful in his escape um, and basically becomes a brain in a jar. And that's the ending of the movie. All right. And this is, uh, this is what the, direct, this is what the oh, director has said. Okay. According to uh, Sean Brani uh, on the making of the feature at The Whisperer behind the scenes. <laughs> Very uh, funny. Uh, uh, Lovecraft was better at setups than endings. Oof. From a dramatic standpoint, Lovecraft's story brought the writers through, uh, through that would be uh, act two, in his mind, of a standard movie structure, and felt incomplete. The character mm. of Hannah and uh, opening the gates to Yogov were introduced in order to make it a good movie. <laughs> wow. Okay, so here's the thing. I have two thoughts on this. Yes, I agree. You usually Lovecraft, his endings are just like the guy, you know, the protagonist running away screaming and, you know, just escaping and saying, and then he, he survived, obviously, to tell the story. So, yes, his endings are just like That's someone running away. I agree. But the whole thing with creating a portal to, you know, Pluto, which they call Yagoth, yeah. uh, is it kills the whole thing of like they, they, they have wings to fly through space. Like, and you would put the brain in a jar. I guess you would still need to be a brain in a jar as Wait, a human to survive on, I, to I'm, survive I'm, on Pluto. I'm pretty sure not all of them could fly through space. That's true. They did say that some of them can't fly through space. Okay. So they're thinking about the poor wingless. It's, it, it was an accessibility thing. They needed a portal for it's for ADA purposes, right? <laughs> for accessibility. For the ones that didn't have the wings. They're, they're basically in wheelchairs, right? So, but anyway, so, but yeah, that's, wow, that sounds very interesting. I don't know. I still feel like I want to watch it to see how they did. I, I kind of want to watch it, honestly. Um, Were the reviews just, not so bad? Uh, it's 6.5. Oh, is, you know. Okay. Right. Um, so, I mean, I disagree with the, with the assessment that uh, Lovecraft is bad at endings. Um. Thing is, and th this is the, why I will defend this guy to no end. All of his stories are good. They're just the same story a lot of the times, but they're all good, right? And all of his uh, and a lot of his um, endings are this like, and I will never go back there, and I'm going mad, and so on and so forth. Yeah, okay, that it happens a lot, but it's a good ending to most of his stories because the people see horrible stuff that they shouldn't have seen, and now they're going insane. I mean, it it makes sense. Um, I don't know if you needed to add Act Three to make the Whisperer in Darkness work. Um, I I kind of like the idea that Akeley doesn't get to escape, but then we wouldn't get all of this information, so that doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of in two minds from uh, from that comment from the uh, director, but back to the actual story, the Whisperer in Darkness. One of the key elements that I really enjoyed about it, um, that I think is uh, missing from a lot of other works by uh, Lovecraft, is 
action. There's action in the story. Yeah, it's described through a letter. There's like gunshots going off, dogs are being killed, stuff is going down, like it's a war. And that's awesome, right? And the way he describes this is cool. It's even better because if it was full-on action, not secondhand action, then that would break the immersion of horror. So hearing all this, like, I barely survived, this is my, you know, like, fourth recording, you know, so and so forth. Uh, the recount, like, Tuesday, Wednesday, or however he does it. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And, it's, and every time the letter ends, you're like, all right, that's the last letter. And then the professor goes, and then I received another. And you're like, oh, no, what happened next? And, you know, you keep reading. So, right. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing structure. I really liked it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just as far as my two cents are concerned. And first of all, I, I think the Migo are inter... They don't want us talking about this story because it revealed their truth <laughs> of their presence on Earth. That's why sure. my internet connection is getting... Uh, got interrupted earlier. You you um, laugh, but the very first time we covered uh, Lovecraft, the same thing happened with Call of Cthulhu. Really? Yeah, we had a bunch of uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can dial it back, uh, viewers. Have a look at it. Like we were literally having uh, internet issues the entire time. It was crazy. Yeah, very spooky. Very spooky. Uh, yeah. I mean, this I, this is one of my favorite Lovecraft stories of all time. That's why I suggested it. It really is, besides this, and I think this story and At the Mountains of Madness, it's just his longer stuff. I feel like his longer stuff, I mean, yeah, there's some others that I like, like Pickman's Model, I always thought was effect effective. Um, you know, I, I never really liked Call of Cthulhu. I was never really impressed with that. You know, And I was bored by some of the other longer stories, like, you know, the the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. Like, you know, and I know he's going places. I don't know if you ever read that, but that's that was kind of a chore to read. But this story, um, Shadow Out of Time, I was never a big fan of. But this story in At the Mountains of Madness, I thought were really effective. And At the Mountains of Madness, I think I read after I watched The Thing from 1982, the 1982 with Kurt, with Kurt Russell. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that really, kind of like that isolation in like the cold place, you know, in the, you know, in Antarctica. You know, I think that was really effective. But between this and At the Mountains of Madness, I think those are my two top Cthulhu um, Lovecraft stories. Uh, but, yeah, I, it's, you know, what would you do in this situation? You know, I would put myself in the situation, too. Would you want to, you know, plumb the depths of the unknown? And, and I really like how he incorporated, you know, things that were just being discovered, like the discovery of Pluto. You know, like the, the discovery of Pluto, and that becomes Yagoth. And, you know, so for that time, it's like, you know, obviously the planet was new. So, yeah, it's just I, the tension gets ratcheted up. I really like that letter style. And I've written like a few things myself, just kind of inspired by that. That way, I mean, I just wrote a story uh, recently. and I, I wrote a story over time serially on a website like that was sort of an homage to the way that he did this story. So. Yeah, I mean, it's again, I think it's a great mix of sci fi and horror, as you know, Robert made a good point that it's not just these hulking, unknowable creatures. It's like you know, actually have like a species of beings that they're potentially encountering. But he really holds off on the description and lets you, you know, kind of you never see a living one of these creatures. And you're never really sure if what you saw that the bodies floating in the river were these creatures, you know, but then he describes them. But it, he never shows them to you, really. So you get to really picture it in your head. So, yeah, I think this is the, his, one of his crowning achievements, personally. So, yeah, I'm kind of biased in that way. Hmm. But you guys make some really good points. And, I, you know, just thinking of Lovecraft and trying to, like, just the repetition of it. But how he, I guess that's his genius and his, his why he's lasted so long. It's how he makes that same formula work somehow to a greater or lesser extent every time i can only speak for myself right and i say it, it works for me um mm -hmm. you know there's regarding your question you know what what would we have done in that situation would we go and investigate i mean i'm going but i'm not going alone and i'm not going unarmed right um yeah 
there's no way, you know, if, you know, we only live once. Uh, and if you pass up an opportunity to touch the infinite, why are you alive again? What's the point right. of your existence? Yeah. You know? Good point. Good point. But yes, come with a, come with a posse, right? Come with Definitely, like a bunch man. of man. I mean, I, you know, I'd call, you know, I, I'd call from uh, Vlad to Alexander. I'd get everyone in my phone book. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's interesting because it's, you know, yeah, that's the one thing for me was like, but again, that's a story. If it was this all out war and they were thinking things through rationally, then it would be less effective of a story. You know, like, hey, I brought all these people with me with guns and we went to war like that's that's like alien versus aliens. Right. It's like that they diminish the creature, you know, in the alien movies between alien and aliens kind of became like a shootout rather than a horror movie. You know, which with the first one was a horror movie and then Aliens became sort of a war movie, you know. So it's that they change the dynamic of the creatures. You know, a lot of people See, would say, the, yeah. The thing, the thing with that is, right, I kind of agree with you. But at the same time, right, if you look at Alien, Aliens and Alien 3, you basically get what Alien 2 would have been in Alien 3. Because it's is exactly that. And you can see mm -hmm. why it's not as effective. Right? right, you introduce a new in a new environment. The thing is, the the creature was specifically designed for the first movie, and you can feel that it's been designed for the first movie. So what James Cameron right. had to do in the second one is to design a movie around uh, what's it called, an idea that would bring spark to this to this formula. Because if he would have went with Alien Two, we would have gotten Alien Three. If you if you get the jumbled. Yeah, yeah, something. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I agree. I don't see how you could improve upon it. Yeah, you know, the formula. Maybe a better script, but I don't know. But yeah, so he took it to kind of sort of maybe I guess the next logical step. But exactly yeah. with aliens. I mean, yeah. <laughs> all you do is add an S, and now it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine? Before it was like, a James problem. Cameron, yeah. James yeah. Cameron trying to do an interpretation, a movie version of The Whisperer in Darkness. It totally would end with like this huge shootout, right? Like, like all sure. these like you know Tommy guns, you know Tommy guns and there stuff. There would also like, be a bunch of blue aliens who would be you know trying to get their unobtainium. Oh man, the fact right. that he called a material that can't be obtained normally unobtainium, like it just uh, it ruffles actually, my feathers. It's actually a science fiction convention. Yeah, yeah. It's it's literally a meme in science fiction. They call it. Um, yeah, God. I actually God burn actually them all, was, burn them all. I I actually thought it was a scientific term that when you didn't know the name, when something hadn't been named yet, or something that's difficult to get, rather, is sometimes called by scientists actual un unobtainium. But I could be totally. I mean, wrong, there, there but... are roots. There are roots to to calling it unobtainium rather than just being lazy on James Cameron part. Yeah. Right. Right. There yeah, Nikki, come on. <laughs> I, uh, I burned these roots to the ground. It's a stupid name. <laughs> Salt the earth. But yeah, I don't know. Any other... Circling back around to Whisper in Darkness. Um, I don't know. Any other thoughts? That Unobtainium is a term used to refer to a material that cannot be accessed. Well, there you go. Such a there material may be rare. All right. I'm, I need to create a time machine to go back in time. So we don't have the word unobtainium. This is this is awful. There you go. This is getting so worse and real, worse by the moment. In real life, it, you're, you're talking about it's used in real life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, that's right. This is a dictionary definition. Yeah, so it's uh, it's not something that James Cameron put out of thin air and uh, well, yeah. Used. So. I mean, if you don't like the term, then yeah, make the time machine and go back and change it. I suppose exactly, James but Cameron. I want to apologize from the bottom of my heart. I thought you were stupid. No, it's the world. And it has <laughs> to pay the price. All right. Um, back to Whisper in Darkness. Um, it, I know Robert's been kind of quiet. I want to pick Yeah, yeah. Robert. Go on, Robert. You know, I you mean, said you read this a lot. This, there's plenty of controversial things that uh, XJ has said that I'm sure you'd love to sink your teeth. Wait, one second, though. So was okay. this XJ and Nikki, were, was this the first time you had both read this? For me, whisper, in, whisper in darkness. You know, I want to say yes, but I actually can't because 
maybe I've read it before and then I got mixed it no. up with something. Like I said, I, I can't tell the stories about. <laughs> well, it is the first time that I read it, yes. Okay. I want to defend, I want to defend Lovecraft from the connotations of the word uh, formula. All right, you can say that he writes according to a formula, but it's not a very useful term because his particular formula has such vast potential that the connotations which the word arouses in the reader are misleading. I mean, just think you've got the the the, the quasi supernatural siblings in Dunwich Horror. You've got the lighter verse creatures and the strategic um, measures that those imply in The Haunt of the Dark. You've got the hybridization of the shadow of Innsmouth. You've got the mind switch theme in The Shadow Out of Time. You've got the prehistoric uh, vistas of At the Mountains of Madness with actual revival of prehistoric creatures. You've got the necromancy in the case of Charles Dexter Ward, and I'm sure I haven't mentioned all of them. It's it's certainly, there's no chance, if you click with these stories, there's no chance of doing like XJ and, and confusing one with the other. So the thing to do is to read them in the spirit in which you're supposed to read them, and uh, uh, then you'll find all the variety that the the... Uh, that you can possibly want from that particular subgenre of fantasy stroke science fiction. Um, the um, by the way, another point uh, about Robert E. Howard, his uh, he wasn't always, or even most of the time, writing Conan stories. There are eighteen Conan stories. His output was vast, and I'm sure the Conan stories, their word count would just be a small percentage of the total. If you add them all up. Okay, good defense. I like it. Yeah, that was great. I don't know, XJ. Yeah. Just one more. Just one more point. Is just that, one more. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, just one more point. Slam dunk it. Lovecraft has Thanks. a strange effect on critics. Uh, quite brainy critics, advanced critics, cannot write the truth about Lovecraft. For example, Brian Aldiss in. Uh, trillion Year Spree, his history of science fiction, mentions Lovecraft and says a few of his stories might be classed as science fiction. And then he goes on to mention Herbert West Reanimator, which is a kind of rather ridiculous uh, Lovecraftian uh, concoction of short stories. He doesn't mention The Shadow After Time, or The Whisper in Darkness, at The Mountains of Madness, three of his best stories, which are all pretty straight science fiction. And and that's a, a good critic. Aldous is a good critic, but because it's Lovecraft, he's uh, I don't know. There's some kind of field of force around Lovecraft which causes critics' minds to to deviate from the obvious. Um, I think you know, and I think it suffers from. And this is like treading into like the inevitable territory. And I don't know if you guys touched on this in your other episodes, but now it's popular to dunk on. Uh, Lovecraft because of listen the guy had some like fairly racist things in his stories you know and apparently according to the people that have read his letters which I haven't you know he was kind of expressed some pretty bad ideas in terms of race and things I mean you know I mean being an Italian American you know like he uses a derogatory term for Italians directly in uh Pickman's model one of my favorite earlier stories of his you know and describing them, sort of describing them as like subhuman and they wouldn't be able to comprehend, you know, what the Aryan man, you know, basically the Anglo-Saxon can comprehend. So it's like, listen, I mean, I get it. But and I think that that is you sort of are hands are tied as a critic. You need to like ha you're sort of hand like you need to kind of shake your finger at and you can't really give Lovecraft too much credit. You know, so that I, his, I'm always his, suspicious of like whatever you know. people say, whatever in the correspondence, all you need to ever say is his cat's name was N word man. That's all you really, that's all you need to say. Um, yeah. when it comes to Conan, Conan, um, I, I, I am sorry to correct, uh, Robert, there were 21 stories, oh, uh, written, <laughs> but um, 
but only 17 published uh, during his life. And he wrote uh, the the rough estimate is around 300, with if, which if we take 21 stories out of that, that's around 7%. That's 7% mm-hmm. exactly um, of of his written work. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm of the opinion, like, there's always the question of the death of the author, and can you separate the author from the work? I, you know, I'm kind of a, I don't know, again, it's not to get too philosophical about human life and human human beings in general, but I try to say, okay, can we extract something, unless the person's absolutely reprehensible, you know, can we extract something of value even from, you know, can you find the lotus flower in the pile of poop? You know, the lotus flower grows out of like manure, right? So it's can you pluck the story and the genius of their their tales or their talent out of the mire that the person themselves waded into in their personal lives and in their beliefs? I, I tend to lean towards yes, but you guys, your mileage may vary. I'm curious to hear what you think about that, I don't especially think that, when it comes to Lovecraft. That wasn't the point in Aldous's, uh trillion year spree he doesn't mention the racism problem at all he just yeah. seems to not be able to read what lovecraft actually wrote in terms of okay film. or maybe maybe he didn't he didn't bother perhaps he just latched onto a few stories and thought well that's it uh, and and gosh i mean if you do that with lovecraft if you just read herbert west reanimator and the lurking fear and all that you come up uh, you you begin to think he's just a sickie, uh, you know. Yeah, I guess my point was, even if you don't, uh, even if they don't outright state, you know, Lovecraft is a racist, I feel like they need to like keep that in the back of their minds as they're right. You don't like them too much, you know. I don't know. That's I'm always suspicious of ulterior motive. So even though maybe he didn't bring it up explicitly, like other reviewers, the racism issue with Lovecraft. Sometimes I wonder if they're like, oh, I read a few of his stories. I didn't want to read too many because he's a bad guy. So why would I read too much of his stuff? And I read some of the short <laughs> I love, stuff. I love the accent you did there. That's great. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, oh, I don't know yeah. about it. I don't know. He seems I don't, like a I bad guy. guy. <laughs> I'm not going to read too much of his stuff. So just to, to your point, Robert. Yeah, I mean, that's I'm, even though they're not stating it outright, it's like, oh, the purity police of pop culture are watching you always, you know. So they're like, "Oh, is Brian Aldis liking Lovecraft too much?" Well, uh, it, might have, it might be cancellation time. Anthony, let them watch on as I go on my conquest and against Unobtainium. Yeah, um, me too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- one more man has joined the army. Um, right. Um, it's it's it is difficult. To, to talk about someone and separate them from the work they did, especially somebody like Lovecraft, because a lot of his claims talk about, um, you know, work coming directly from him, from his dreams, from his nightmares, you know, from something pure within the mind of the individual, right? A lot of the time, uh, an author admits to having inspiration from other works he has read or from uh, people that have inspired him. But a lot of the time, you, you do have to sort of consile with the idea that uh, Lovecraft, uh, although he did take uh, inspiration from other sources, right? Like a lot of what he himself was afraid of is what's in his stories, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, at least I didn't see that in the Whisper in the Darkness, any, any of that kind I... of stuff. Yes, actually. I I can't say that his uh, background uh, bothers me in the slightest when reading his stories. Mm-hmm. It's only when it becomes way too obvious that I roll my eyes. <clears throat> but that has more to do with the fact that I really don't like authors that insert too much of themselves into their stories, which I made very clear with uh, my rant. Heinlein. With uh, yeah. Heinlein. Yeah. So, so, you know, in The Call of Cthulhu, he was even more pointed in his descriptions of certain people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and and I in in this particular story I roll my eyes a little bit at when he describes how uh how the uh how the ancient traditions of New England holds uh, is mu- is so much uh, better than the modern uhization and urbanization of cities and I'm thinking to myself 
when you say ancient traditions of New England, who exactly are you referring to? The the settlers that came later or the actual, you know, people who lived in that area before <laughs> the conquest? And I'm like, you know, other than things like that, I will roll my eyes, but then I'll just pass, pass by it. <clears throat> unless it becomes too, uh, unless he keeps bringing it up, then I'm like, okay, that's a problem here. But yeah, um, I was like, yeah, same thing. It's like, was he finally going after rednecks in this story? You know, like he's is he going after rednecks? Is he going after? Is he attacking white people now? Like, you know, hey, maybe there was no one else. There was no one else left to criticize, right? So now it's, I don't know. Yeah, it's like no one was spared his. His yeah, ire. I mean, his, in, in, my mind, in, in my mind, in my mind, his uh, his his personality has very little to do with the stories that he write. You know, and all okay. everything has to do with what he actually writes to me, because I don't like to make conjectures uh, that I don't have. Right. A, um, yeah, uh, a direct line to, but I I think uh, like. I think my biggest problem with H.P. Lovecraft is I really cannot separate the stories that he wrote apart. Like, irregardless of what uh, Robert said, you know. I mean, the, he he reminds me of another writer, L.E. Modestet Jr. And I don't know if any one of you oh. have read him before. He wrote I've one. Tried. He wrote one. Uh, his very first one, the, the, the Magic of Recluse. And I loved it. I loved it. Then I read more, and it is the same story. I read more, and it is the same story. I just, it, it, I'm like, I'm sorry, man. It's like the first, what, the first one that I ever read was amazing, but everything yeah. else was the same. And I, uh, to this day, I can't tell them apart in my mind. It's like it's all the same, all the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tried to. I read the first one ages ago, and then I same thing. Tried to read it, he, and he puts out so much stuff. Like he was Brian Sand, uh, uh, he was um, Sanderson before Sanderson was Sanderson, right? Like he's just pumping out these books, yeah. you know, brand, you know, and and then when I'm like, wait a minute, this is yeah, this seems really familiar. So yeah, it's Modus said exactly yeah, I know. the same. And the one time he tried to be different was when he wrote his protagonist was a woman instead of a man, but it was terrible because the woman <laughs> is actually a man. <laughs> oh, oh wow okay wow. What a no 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 not a, a, not, a, not like a not like a, he wrote the woman as a man it's like oh okay i was gonna say surprise he takes no, on no, a disguise no, the and, woman wa- okay. was written as a, a like a man it's like okay a, at the end of the day like i really liked his first one the magic of recluse but everything else that came after was just like uh i can't tell it apart man and that is the same problem i suffer with lovecraft all lovecraft. his stories okay are the same to me. So Robert's <laughs> Robert's valiant efforts at trying to get you to think twice about the formulaic ver- it, no no effect on you then XJ huh? Unfortunately, I'm just reading the stories in the wrong way. You are, you are. <laughs> it's like as if, if you're Mickey, fine. will you jump in to defend me? It's like yes, I fun. will. I mean, despite the fact that we are mortal enemies on <laughs> on the Whisper in Darkness, I will still not let not let, well will not let this fucking stupid idea stand that you could read something wrong. But I mean, it's, it's this like is a battle for another day. It's uh-huh. like as if I were to say, "Oh, uh, all the Sherlock Holmes stories so they're, they're all the same and can't tell them apart." And the, it's always this Sherlock Holmes, and then somebody comes with a problem, and then he solves it. Ooh, oh, he's got you there, actually. This guy doesn't know what's reading it wrong. He's got you there. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I mean, all this fog and uh, <coughs> and, and <laughs> how I dare mean, what, Sherlock what, Holmes not go somewhere from I mean, London? If, yeah, you, sorry, feel, on, if you feel that way about Sherlock Holmes, then that's how you feel about Sherlock Holmes. Like, I mean, I've never, I've, oh, I've I'm never, not. I've never, you know, I've always felt that you don't have to justify why you like or dislike a story, and it's the same case here. I honestly, I really just can't tell the stories apart. That's like. Maybe you can say that I read the stories wrong. Maybe you can say I don't have any <laughs> taste. Maybe you can say uh, I'm illiterate, barbarian, neanderthal. I don't know. But the thing I is, wouldn't compliment I you like literally that. cannot separate the stories in my head. 
maybe there's something there's a wire that's missing in my head i don't know but you know that's just how it is <laughs> see, see this is why this is why i get mad with uh, uh what's it called robert tells me that i read something wrong like what, what do you mean you know it's exactly the same problem <laughs> well, um, what, I mean, what i mean is that you've read it in such a way that you don't enjoy it you know i can't say that well yeah, it's not my be, fault though. It's not XJ's no, fault not that he didn't. It is. I'm you know not what I mean? It is. To, I'm to not be saying. to be perfectly frank, there was a time when I was reading the Whisperer in the darkness that I felt like, man, is this gonna keep on going longer? I really wish it was over. <laughs> but that has more to do with the pacing that HP Lovecraft has in general. Mm. Like he's very slow. Mm. But that could be that is actually more of a modern reader problem, I think. Because we are much more used to faster paced stories now, so I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not really holding it against him, and I don't dislike the story. I just can't tell them apart. Yeah. See, <laughs> actually, I was, I was lucky because I was reading a lot of these older stories when I was young. After I stopped reading comics for a while, you know, like my mother basically sat me down and made me read all this old stuff, um, and I got used to slow burns. Um, but yeah, the beginning was horrible. The first like two years of reading this stuff, I was like, oh my God, when is Captain America going to come out and punch this guy? You know, like, I get it. Um, Robert, I feel, right, that all, all your theory needs is a bit of rebranding. And then people will get behind it. See, when you say it's, you've read something wrong, there's an implication of guilt right towards the person oh, yeah, right. well, 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 right. oh, oh, oh here we go here we go yes i yes. see that i see that and i uh, that's my fault for uh, not thinking up a uh, a better way of saying it but the motivation okay the motivation is for other readers to preserve them from getting a negative impression from for example the whisper in darkness or other lovecraft stories or whatever it is I don't want them to be put off. And mm, we're doing mm. a podcast which will be uh, watched by trillions of people, you know, <laughs> avidly. Uh, At some point. Depending on our every word. And it's, it's therefore worries me the thought of somebody watching this and saying, oh, well, I was going to try Lovecraft, but I think I won't bother because uh, all the stories are the same. And that sounds a bit boring. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Give it a chance, people. Give it a chance. This is the thing, right? right? We we talk about all kinds of different stories. There's only been like, I think, once when not only were we all united that something sucked, but we were so upset about it that I mean, we spent basically the whole thirty minutes talking about how bad it was. No, so of an experience. The snows of Kilimanjaro. Oh, I remember that day like it was Christmas. It, um, it was a, it was the only time in the history of this podcast when we banded together like brothers. That's right. That's right. It was <laughs> it was the finally the the Danes and the the Saxons they thrown down their weapons and they're going to fight Perhaps together should, against uh, the French. Again, with Anthony uh, with Anthony joining in. Uh, Another another Ernest Hemingway story. Yeah, yeah we could. No, no I, feel like I, don't I, to... I don't want to read the Snows of Kilimanjaro again. No, no not the Snows of Kilimanjaro. Um, yeah, pick another short story. Maybe we'll see it. what's what happens. Yeah, all another, of your another, short another stories. Another Hemingway. All of your yeah, short stories feel Hemingway like story. a like a like a novel. Um, right. Yeah. I think I think we've yapped enough about uh, the Whisper in Darkness. At all right. Point. Um, Final my grade. final, yeah, my final score is a a very generous nine out of ten. I'm giving it one more than I would have. I would have given it like eight, but I'm giving it nine because through the course of talking about the story on the podcast, um, I got to relive the memories of how it felt, um, reading the story and really following every letter, every word desiring to know what's happening in the house and seldom Lovecraft stories do that for me and seldom any stories do that f uh, for me where I'm you know grasping at every word so for me it was a resounding success of a tale there you go I I'm gonna give it also a nine 
out of 10. Not And I'm not begrudging one. I'm not begrudging it at all. I'm not being generous. I think I might... I might be being as not as generous as I should be, but nine, <clears> nothing <throat> is perfect. I'm gonna go nines. One of my favorite stories. It was very. You could go nine point nine five. Nah, 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 nah. Warp nine point nine nine nine. No, uh, no. I, I, I think I'll stop at nine. You know, there is some aspects that I feel like could be. In, you know, I was a little incredulous here and there reading the story of how the people were behaving in the story, but you know, otherwise, it's. Maybe it's nostalgia too, fueling my score, but I it was one of the you know the be- I had I remember I've read this several, many many times over my life I've lost count and just every time I enjoy it every time I find something new, um, yeah do it, it, it again it suffers sometimes from the verbosity and the bloat that you know Lovecraft throws into some of his tales especially the longer ones, but all of that aside it's just a very seminal story in my appreciation of horror and science fiction. In my personal experience, so yeah, I'm gonna give it a enthusiastic nine out of ten. All right. Next day, Robert. Uh, I will give yeah. it a point five score higher than whatever I gave the Dunwich Horror, for which I cannot remember. Yeah. <laughs> it, it wow. Is, it is a it is a better story than the Dunwich Horror. <clears throat> okay. For sure. Uh, yeah. But. To me, it is the same story. So there you go. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And <laughs> you know, your opinion va- is valued just as much as anyone else's, right? Just because it's negative. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Robert. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Nikki. Sorry, I mixed the two of you. <laughs> I was saying, I was saying what Robert wanted to say. <laughs> maybe, but, you know, because maybe, you're maybe to... there is a wire that's missing in my head that I keep mixing things uh-huh. up. That's why I can appreciate Lovecraft. I mean, I, I'm yes, please, Robert. What what is your score, and how many no, tens is say, it out of a hundred? I don't mind admitting there are wires missing in my head because, for example, I I couldn't get that story that Nikki likes so much, Two Kinds of Fool. So he yeah. um, he obviously is a better reader of that story than than I am. <laughs> you know, I'm the best reader of that. I'm like, give me yeah. more go. Yeah. Anyway, but do you yeah. see the point I'm trying to make? It's yeah, yeah, the yeah, person yeah. who enjoys the story is reading it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get what you're saying. It's just like exactly just like uh, um, what's it called? Just like um, Graham McNeil stopped being on your side as soon as you said the reader reads it wrong. I think no one is going to support you if you have the word wrong in there. I think you really need to come up with a better way to describe it. Uh, I'm not so much bothered by nobody supporting me, but I, 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 take, I take what you mean. Um, if I can think of a better way of saying it, I will. Uh, anyway, I give this one 10 out of 10. Oh, um, all right. Well, there you go. Wow. It's a, it's one of the top Lovecraft stories, and you can't get more ten out of ten than that. What was the what was the score you gave the Call of Cthulhu? Do you remember? I don't remember, but it that also deserves a ten out of ten. I do okay. I do recall you saying the Call of Cthulhu is probably Lovecraft's best work. Did I? I think so. Wow. Certainly Maybe. one of the best. Um, Certainly one of the best. I would say there's about 10. We, really uh, at the, at the time things. when we were doing a Call of Tulhu, we didn't give any scores. That no. came in okay. later. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. I guess uh, I guess that about wraps up the Whisperer. Is it Whisperer in the Dark? You see, you can't Whisper even in remember darkness. the right word. You can't <laughs> even remember the titles of the story. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. It's like I keep mixing it up with the Haunter... <laughs> What was the rest of it? The Haunter <laughs> in the Dark. The Shadow oh. over the Haunter of the Whisperer in Inglis. <laughs> Man, I would read that story. Imagine if all of the characters from all of those stories like get together and they're like, right, we need to fix the world quickly. <laughs> like the Avengers of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft yeah. coming together, the Justice League Society. Yeah. New England Academics Assemble. <laughs> all right yeah. uh, i Go guess ahead. that wraps Go up ahead. uh that wraps up the podcast for this 
HP Lovecraft novella. Uh, I shall not shame myself by not remembering the name. Um, and if you guys enjoyed the, if the audience enjoyed the uh, podcast, please like and subscribe and help you, us. Actually, XJ, I just wa- I just watched the 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 ending of Dunwich Horror. You didn't give it a score. I didn't give object- it a score. You didn't give it a score. You said objectively. I I can't really give this a score because I found it like this, this and that, but I realized the craftsmanship and so on and so forth. So All right, you, then it's you, 0.5 you, higher than that score. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for watching. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.